there were about 20 desks of students studying for exams. Oh, wow. Who oh, kept walking over and asking us to be quiet. <laughs> so- <laughs> Welcome to Sincast, presented by CinemaSins. All right, everybody, welcome to the Sincast. This is Chris Atkinson from CinemaSins, joined by Jonathan Watkins from CinemaSins. Hello, hello. And today we are greeted by special guests. Uh, director, writer, editor of Cursed Films, five episode series, Jay Cheel is here, and Mitch Horowitz, who is a historian of alternative spirituality. I will have, to, it takes me a lot to get that out, uh, and everything. I, I, I always like when that invokes laughs. That's always a good sign. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I do not mean to demean right, anything. Quite all right. It, it is me trying to say the words that are that's hard. Um, uh, historian of alternative spirituality who is in the film and uh, gives his insight mm-hmm. in the five episode series and gives his insight on all this. And this is about uh, uh, five particular movies that have been branded as as cursed, as the production was cursed see what happened after the movie was made or during the movie's production and all that. See, that's a proof of a curse. And Jay Cheel and Mitch Horowitz are here to say what about that? <laughs> well, what, what are we here to say about that? I mean, the the idea of the show is to both celebrate the films that we're, we're talking about. Uh, well, maybe four out of the five films. I don't think really anyone considers Twilight Zone, the movie, a classic in mm. any way. But nope. uh, I'm certainly a, a big fan of of the the four other films that we mm-hmm. discuss, and a big horror fan in general, and a huge documentary fan as well. So, being able to uh, make a documentary series about these horror films and talk to a lot of the people that were involved in making them, and to talk to get to talk to people like Mitch about this concept of cursed films was a very uh exciting thing for me and and i think the idea from the beginning was always to just sort of as we put it explore the tension between the rational and irrational and just look at why we're so fascinated by these stories and how they i suppose affected the people who actually worked on these films and what they feel about the legends that have kind of followed in uh, the path of the the release and legacy of of these movies, so um, that was that was kind of my um, yeah, I, I, that's what made me excited. I mean, as a documentary filmmaker, I just like being able to sit down and talk to cool and interesting people, and um, there is a ton of cool and inter- interesting people in this series that we got to speak with, including Mitch. Um, it's amazing who you actually did get to, uh, sit down and talk about some of the stuff. Cause a lot of the times it gets into, uh, you know, some very emotional things because people have, have died and, and, uh, you know, in, especially in the case of like, you know, twilight zone and, and poltergeist and these movies were, where there was actual deaths involved and people, you know, it, you know, you get people on camera and they, you know, they're just like, it's 30 something years later and they're just, they just break down talking about it. Yeah. I mean, part of the challenge with this series was making contact with these people and asking them to not only uh, talk about these things that happened so many years ago, but do it for a show called cursed films. <laughs> and right. you know, that, that in itself is a bit of a challenge, especially for the people who were affected by these these uh, tragedies in a very real way. So it was always my intent to, to offer them the opportunity to speak openly and honestly about what took place without any sort of obligation to, I guess, uh, framing it in a, a supernatural or spooky fashion, which you might find in, in uh, you know, some other shows that deal with similar subject matter. So, um, I think there was a lot of uh, relief in that regard, especially from someone like, you know, Craig Reardon, who 
worked on poltergeist and and used the uh, human skeletons in the the pool sequence and <laughs> had, had you know that's kind of what people think was the so potentially the source of the curse for that film and that to him is a, 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 a an idea that is um, just not acceptable and when I reached out to him he actually his first response was to threaten to sue me personally if wow. I even mentioned his name in the show because he had been burned previously um, doing an interview for E! True Hollywood Story, which, uh, you know, if if there was ever a, a, a model that we wanted to avoid. It was that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so it, after, after ex, you know, a couple of ex email exchanges with Craig and basically suggesting to him that everything that he said to me in his initial email, I'm more than happy to have him say on camera, he was on board. And he's, I think he provides one of the great moments in the series. Yeah, he well, does. And Gary Sherman. Um, right. Yeah. Because yeah. Gary yeah. Sherman, you know, I've watched a lot of his movies. I've never seen him interviewed for anything. So I've just always thought of him as kind of this obscure, you know, this like cult director guy, you know, Vi the guy who made Vice Squad and Dead and Buried. And um, just to see him, uh, oh my, it was heartbreaking. Um, yeah, he, he, uh, he was great. He was very open, very um, willing to talk about uh, any anything regarding his relationship with Heather and very uh, honest and, and a lot of empathy and you know just a, a great guy in general. Um, the the reality of that shoot, we filmed his interview at a university and had this great backdrop in this library. And one row over, there were about twenty desks of students studying for exams. Oh, wow. Who huh. kept walking over and asking us to be quiet. <laughs> so <laughs> Gary Sherman is sharing this, you know, heartfelt story about Heather O'Rourke. And then a student would pop their head around the corner and glare at us because we're interrupting their studies. So <laughs> that's the reality of filmmaking. Oh, man. You were saying that you, you didn't want to emulate E! True Hollywood Story. And I'm very thankful that you didn't do that uh, because it, it, you know, they, it gets into, I, I, I don't know. I sort of lose more interest when they try to go that angle. Um, what I felt like you were going like what model it seemed to fit more was the Penn and Teller's bullshit is what it felt like uh, to me because you would introduce uh, people who, who were on the side of it being cursed or it being black magic and you would introduce them very, very simply. Like, here's a guy who's an exorcist. Here's a guy who, who's a black magician and everything. And then they would do their process and everything. But you would just let that play out on film. Uh, you know, you just, you know, you're not judging them. You're just saying, here's the other side of it. But it, it kind of has, by the, by the time you pull it back at the end, you have all the people, here's the, here's the sanity that we were, we're looking for in this whole thing. And I found that really interesting yeah i mean i will say that although i don't think that as we were filming ea coetting cursing a, f a film that that would actually have any sort of effect um although i will say we didn't mention the name of the film in the show we bleeped it out but that film has been delayed mm. so i'll oh. you know, leave it at that but um i i didn't necessarily you know, align with their, what, what they were uh, suggesting or, or their beliefs, but I will say they were Nate and, and um, Eric were two of the nicest people I've, I've met. And they were so willing to talk about this stuff and share their, their, um, their beliefs and their, their process. And, you know, as, as kind of uh, foreign as it kind of felt in the moment, it was a lot of fun hanging out with those guys. And, you know, I, I would definitely do it again without cameras. I, you know, maybe not a, a ritual. <laughs> like, we'll <laughs> I, I actually had written down not enough Nate Bales. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I yeah. found him absolutely fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Nate is the best. He's, he's great. He's just such a, a kind guy. And of course we're all horror fans of, and yeah. you know, we, we, if there was one thing we could really connect with it, it was our, our love of, of horror. So it was a lot of fun filming with those guys.
Yeah. I, and I don't, and like I said, I don't think you, you do it in a way that judges those people at all. I think you're just very straightforward about it and everything, but it does seem like you have a theme here where it says, this is, this is, you know, this movie has been said to be cursed, but is it? And you kind of, you know, uh, by the end of it, you have a bunch of people who are like, well, let me explain why it's not. And I, I think that's why I, I like that is because it's well-rounded and everything. And, uh, yeah. I mean, it's it, the, the idea of filming someone showing you how you would, you might curse a film is a sort of simplistic, um, demonstration of, of, I guess, uh, some sort of idea of how this could occur, but that's where I was also really happy to talk to someone like Mitch who could also provide a perspective that I think was a little more thoughtful and, and actually opened me up, uh, uh, you know, a little more to accepting that very simply, we don't know everything and that there, and, you know, Mitch, I'll let you speak to this, but specifically in the exorcist episode, um, there's, there's the, the, the thoughts, uh, near the end of the episode, this idea that that film presents the, the doctors as the sort of, um, Im- impotent, uh, group that can't really do anything for Reagan or her mother and, mm-hmm. uh, are sort of caught up in really not having any idea of what is wrong. And, and the, uh, it's ultimately the, uh, the Catholic priests that come in and, and save the day. And, and, uh, we, pr- we look at this as, as sort of, um, we have an uh, interview Hector Avalos who has some interesting ideas about horror films as missionary tools as well. Mm-hmm. And the, mm-hmm. presenting the skeptic whose mind is, is turned and they're ultimately convinced by the, the supernatural occurrences that they're confronted with. And, um, I, I, that was just such an interesting angle to me and, and one that I really appreciated. Yeah. It's fascinating. You know, some, the wrap around the exorcist when it premiered and even to this day is that there's, there's something unsavory about it. There's something that's going to possibly open the door to some sort of ugly influences. And yet William Peter Blatty, who, who wrote the original novel, The Exorcist, uh, died a couple of years ago, mm-hmm. was a devout Catholic. He saw uh, the novel and the book, in addition to being entertainment, as being kind of evangelical tools. And in fact, uh, it is true that about two years after the film's premiere, uh, the number of applications of young men who wanted to enter seminary to join the priesthood spiked. There was a precipitous spike because the figure of Father Damien is this kind of masculine, trustworthy, unusual movie hero wearing a priest collar. And the rationalists are seen as hapless, cynical, not knowing which way to turn, and these religious forces uh, save the day. And so much of what we today in the U.S. think about exorcism, or even knowing the term exorcism, uh, comes from that movie, even for people who haven't seen it. You know, I, I, I doubt that the term exorcism would be anything more than an obscure crossword term in our nation today mm-hmm. had it not been for that movie. Um, is there anything like you know, going into this? I'm sure there is. This is kind of a stupid question, but it gets you it gets you talking about this. I thing. love stupid questions. Um, <laughs> it's the only kind but, we like. Uh, I was wondering, like, if you when you went into this, was there anything in any of the five stories, in all of the five stories, were there things that you learned that you didn't know going in? Um. You know, it's it's funny. It, it was actually something that we had to fight against a little bit with this, um, because it, these are these legends are talked about quite a bit. You know, like if you're a horror fan, you probably have heard about a lot of of these uh, stories. So it it was that was kind of the challenge was to find some sort of perspective that was fresh and not something that has been written on about on Buzzfeed and, you know, a number of times and that various YouTubers have discussed. Um, so I, I mean, in the end, I think probably the Paul Bateson, um, exorcist story, the, the 
real life killer in The Exorcist would be a good example of that. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's something that I don't see pop up on on a lot of those lists. And it's not necessarily that it's a a, any sort of indication of the production being cursed, but it, it is just an unusual connection to that film that that was kind of new to me um and and very interesting and and the fact that ultimately that event helped shape uh William Friedkin's cruising you know he went to interview Paul Bateson and uh used some of that as as research for oh. cruising so that that was definitely an interesting uh discovery during the process of of making this series and in in terms of the um I guess sheer number of strange stories connected connected to a film. It, the Omen is definitely one that, even if you're not a believer in you know the the idea of a film being affected by a, a supernatural force, the number of crazy coincidences that occurred during the making of that film, at least as presented by a great storyteller like Richard Donner, who. You know, if there was anyone that might start juicing a story a little bit to make it <laughs> that much more interesting, <laughs> it's it's Richard Donner uh, and the glee that him and Mace Newfeld kind of take in retelling some of these stories is evident in the the series. But as they lay out these number of strange occurrences, you can't help but be taken back by just how how many of them there are and how wild those coincidences are like the idea of a plane that <laughs> Gregory Peck just missed crashing into the car of the family of the pilot that just dropped him off. And I mean, how, I don't know. I still question a lot of those details. Yeah. But I'm more than happy to listen to Richard Donner. Tell me about them. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say one of my favorite, uh, the, the omen was the one I knew the least about. I mean, I've seen the movie a bunch, but I, I didn't know a lot about the behind the scenes stuff. And I loved, I mean, right off the bat, Richard Donner's just like, yeah, they came to me and said some stuff. And I was just like, yeah, you know, fuck off with that. Satan doesn't want this made. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he was just very, very much like, I'm not listening to that. And then the omen 66.6 kilometers sign. I mean, I don't, that was insane. If that's accurate. Like, yeah, that's I mean, just nuts. Both Mace and and Richard Donner said they they believe that's accurate. They're, that's oh what God. they heard, but I don't know. I, I, that's scary. Yeah, yeah. That's like that's those... where I'm like, oh, I totally believe this now. No, this was <laughs> this should not have been made. <laughs> but that's yeah. also that's also another uh, unique perspective thing. By the end of it, is that the idea that maybe it's not cursed, but it was blessed to be made. Um, uh, which was something that I had, uh, you know, sort of never thought of before in a, in a, in, in the, in that kind of, in that kind of terms, I, I tend not to believe those kind of things at all, but I, I do like the idea that maybe it wasn't cursed, but maybe it was blessed. Yeah. This is a little off topic, but who was coming up with the film clips? Because specifically in the Omen, you guys had a clip from like Hack Lantern. Like, I mean, you guys were, you guys were oh, digging deep. Well, I, can, I can proudly say that I am a, uh, Blu-ray addict. Mm, and me as well. Yeah, I get it. You know, and, and many people criticize my, uh, you know, it's uh, holding on to this physical media thing. And I, I have a lot of Blu-rays and all, I think all of the films were from my Blu-ray collection. Oh, that's awesome. Wow. Uh, except The Conjuring, which I had to go buy. Yeah. Used. Uh, but yeah, I, I just kind of raided my collection for, for any relevant clips. And, and, you know, I love watching some of these types of shows and films where, you know, you, you kind of walk away from it with a little bit of a list of what to check out. And I remember walking away from not quite Hollywood and having a mm-hmm. big oh, yeah. list of um, Australian exploitation films to, to seek out. So I wanted to try to fit in a few movies that might <laughs> inspire people to say to themselves, what is this hack o' lantern? <laughs> yeah, if you if you get more people to check out Hack O' Lantern and you've that that's you've done you've done the Lord's work at this point. Yeah, so I, I, I think agree. you're good. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> 
Mitch, you're not you're you're not in these movies just to dispel these type of things, are you? Are are you just philosophizing about uh, whether a film is cursed or not, or is it is it what human humans go through when they try to come up with uh, uh, reasons why like something might be cursed? Uh, what is sort of your philosophy about a cursed film? Is it sure? Yeah. yeah. I, I don't believe any of these films were cursed, but at the same time, I don't dismiss the possibility that we all participate in some kind of a extra physical life, extra physical existence. I don't, I don't it, it, take that you know prima facie off the table uh, before beginning a discussion with somebody about belief. You know, certainly you could look at beliefs and say, well, you know, there's economics, there's psychology, there's how we're conditioned. There's the need to seek simple answers. And all of that is true to a greater or lesser extent. But in terms of inquiring into the workings and ways of the world, even if a person is not traditionally religious, which I'm not, there are aspects of life that may present us with extra physical questions. Um, in the case of cursed films, I, I share Jay's outlook. You know, By and large, I don't think any of these things were cursed, but I, I am fascinated by the extent to which horror as a genre is the genre that runs closest to uh, belief. You know, people will watch horror movies more than any other genre, including sci-fi, and they'll come away and they'll feel unsettled. They'll feel uh, something that maybe taps or strikes into some primeval feelings about something, which is why, for example, uh, after the release of The Exorcist, Linda Blair, this completely innocent young actress, you know, 10-year-old kid, was not physically safe, was getting harassed by people, you know, and mm -hmm. nobody would, I mean, you know, people are not watching Star Trek and saying, well, William Shatner really is Captain Kirk, you know, I mean, with a few rare exceptions, but, but we watch these films and we feel so affected, or some of us do, you know, by the performances that they, they translate into, into actual belief. And I, I mean, sure, you know, you're always going to hear stories about stalkers or people who grew obsessed with a character or something of that nature. But I'm speaking on a culturally, cultural scale, on an entire cultural scale. You know, so much of what we talk about sometimes, even having to do with the concept of curses or, you know, the dangers of building on a, a Indian burial mound or, you know, something of that nature, even if we haven't seen these movies or haven't seen them since we've been little kids, uh, these themes have entered our culture. They've become part of our system of belief. Yeah, that was, uh, uh, another thing I was kind of surprised because you, cause you guys got Linda Blair to, uh, uh, on an interview and I have, I'd always thought of Linda Blair as this, just ask me anything type of person. Uh, when it gets to the idea that she might have had to have bodyguards after the exorcist, she's like, I don't talk about that. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to talk about that. And it was really like, just, it, I, I felt a lot uh, for her in that moment uh, when she said she didn't talk about it and everything. It was, uh, it was, I, I just, it was just somebody that I'd always thought, well, yeah, I'll answer anything about anything. And uh, that that moment is one of the many moments in this series where you have people who have who kind of break down at a question and everything. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know if that's um, if it's like something that's I, I, I would imagine maybe there's a difficulty in talking about that for personal reasons. But she also she was just very, you know, aware of us not filming parts of her her um sanctuary that revealed where it is and for right. obvious reasons um but yeah that was the one thing she she just wouldn't go there um which which i mean she didn't even have to with that answer <laughs> i mean the answer kind of says it all yeah uh, but but that uh, you know mentioning that the idea of people sort of um i guess for lack of a better term breaking down and and opening up it, it's not that we didn't expect that in this series, but I guess I didn't totally expect it on the, the level that, you know, we, we managed to, um, to capture with some of these interviews and, and even down to someone like Michael Berryman in the crow episode, who I absolutely love his interview he was, great. was just so, he's just so, uh, 
honest, but also like he just in his eyes, you can see the empathy in his eyes and how, how he spoke about Brandon. And he just distilled a lot of these ideas down in this, this way that was unexpected, maybe unfairly. Um, and he, I think he's just one of the strongest, uh, parts of the in, entire series. And a lot of people have said the same thing. Um, and his interview, you know, I, I talked to him for an hour and a half and there w- was so much great stuff that he talked about that didn't make it into the episode that, you know, I would love at some point to release in some form. Um, and I would say the same thing for a lot of the interviews in this series. There was just so much great stuff that we just didn't have time to to put into each episode. Or, or maybe it was just a little, a little too tangential, even though the show has been accused of being a somewhat tangential uh, as it is, but lots of great interviews. Um, and, and that was really the, the best part for me. Well, you don't always know going into a topic like say the crow or, or whatever. Uh, you don't always know what you're about to find when you're a documentary filmmaker, right? Like, uh, you know, if it turns out that it doesn't exactly, meet the theme that you're trying to get to that's that's something that's going to happen at times right yeah i mean we we go out there with a an idea of what we're looking for and there were general themes that you know we had in mind but i I would certainly never uh you know disrupt a, a the flow of a conversation to pull it back to something that I'm aiming for if it feels like it's naturally going somewhere that's potentially more interesting. And I think the, the a big part of that is just going into these interviews uh, it, with a, a more casual um, approach and keeping in the back of my mind what ultimately we need to get, of course, from, from this in exchange. But but being open to just having a dialogue and and just allowing it to go where it naturally goes and you know tr- trying not to show up with um a list of questions or you know uh, conducting a formal interview and i mean i'm hoping that the experience mitch had was kind of in that realm where it it feels a little more casual and i think in that regard you know people will open up a little bit more and we keep our crew very lean we try to have no more than five four people um so it's it's uh and even that i mean for me i I did a couple of doc features before that and i shot those myself so four people is a, a luxury uh for me um but but it's yeah just trying to keep things intimate and small and um, and conversational and just trying to, you know, if Michael Berryman wants to talk about something that he thinks is relevant, but it's not on my to-do list, he's going to, I'm going to let him talk about it and, Mm -hmm. you know, he will see where it goes. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely something that's always changing and, you know, um, like the Omen episode, that whole, the idea of maybe the film was a blessing was something that was not planned, you know, that Mm -hmm. was found after the fact, once we had all of the interviews. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, and with Linda Blair, the, the, her mentioning that the PR person revealed to her that a lot of the, the reports of ambulances and people passing out and so on and so forth was staged for the film, which isn't necessarily <laughs> a surprise, but, mm-hmm. yeah. um, but it is an interesting revelation that does affect the end of that episode in a way that we had not been able to plan for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's why it's, you know, it's, it, you know, if you sit there and you're like, I'm going to do the crow and then you, or whatever mo- or whatever movie you're going to do. Hack a and- lantern. Yeah, hack a lantern. You're going to do one of those. Uh, the uh, you know it. You could come up with a whole bunch of just like really minor things to try to fit your theme, but then it comes off really phony at that point. Um, and and you know, I, I guess a lot of times you have an audience that's like, oh, what's cursed about that film? Oh, well, it wasn't that big of a curse, huh? All right, well, I guess that's not that's not for me or whatever. But like for me, I think it's just movie buff fascinating um even when you don't find like uh, a production that was particularly troubled or anything like that uh just people talking about uh 
you know, just just general things about uh, about the film that, you know, you know, the reason why certain things might have gone wrong or whatever. I don't I mean, I I me personally, I didn't think that was a big deal. I can see why others might, though. I can see that, I guess. Yeah, I mean, there's there's obviously always a um, when you title something a certain way, like Cursed Films is a very direct title that Mm -hmm. is probably it probably does more favors for an algorithm than it does for the show. Uh, and you know, it, it, it suggests something that if you don't deliver on it, some people might, might think, Oh, well, I thought the show was called cursed films. And for me as a documentary filmmaker, I'm a horror fan, but I'm, I, as a filmmaker, at least up until this point, I work in documentaries and I, it has to be, there has to be more there than simply laying out, uh, a list of things that happen on a, a film set that have been laid out in listicles all over the internet and, um, you know, just hitting it like a greatest hits album and then not really attempting to do anything else with that. That's not interesting enough for me to spend, you know, a year, year yeah. and a half of my, my life on. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's, it, I always wanted to use it as the, use these cursed stories as the opportunity to explore, uh, some, some bigger questions about, you know, why we are so fascinated by these stories and, um, some of the more unbelievable sides of these, these, uh, stories. Like when, you know, if, if you talk about a cursed film, my big question was, as someone who does not know a lot about curses, does that mean that someone actually has to have stood there and and cursed the movie, or or can it can a curse be pro, uh, kind of brought upon itself because of the subject matter? So, if if there is this idea that someone could stand there and curse a movie because they weren't, you know, they lost the directing gig to someone else or whatever it might be, what would that look like? And we see what that would look like. It looks kind of silly. Um, but I wanted to explore that just to get that out of the way. So there, there are certain things that may feel a little tangential, but I think are more thematically connected and are, are important. At least they were important to me as the filmmaker, uh, as questions that I ultimately wanted to explore. And I think are, are valuable questions, um, that, that do relate to the legacy of the film, all the films and how we think about them. Yeah, the uh, I, I, there were a couple of like just choice moments. I won't ruin them or anything, but uh, but you know, in the the discussion of the polter of poltergeist being cursed, Zelda Rubenstein's uh, interview was amazing. Uh, I was glad that you found that. Um, yeah, because you know it, it, it's just the way she put it and everything. She just very calmly explained. Uh, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of things about that. And she, she punctuates it by the end uh, and everything. Uh, yeah, really to me, that it. reads as someone who is probably sick of talking about that and yeah. is not thrilled by how the deaths of a couple of performers that she worked with and likely got to know has been reframed in the tabloid media. And the idea of this show you know, we ultimately had to overcome that a little bit because when we're reaching out to people and saying, do you want to talk about the tragic deaths of these, you know, young performers on a film that you worked on 30 years ago and our show is called Cursed Films, the first thing that they probably think is, you know, no thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, so overcoming the E! True Hollywood story sort of approach to this where we're really going out of our way to graft onto the story a spooky supernatural perspective is not something again that I was interested in. If it goes there naturally, then yeah, great. Like the twilight zone episode very clearly does not attempt to graft any sort of supernatural perspective on what happened on that movie, because it very clearly was not, it was just, and ultimately that's, it runs through a lot of these legends. It's, it's a lot of, um, uh, almost like labor violations, you know, like yeah. it, it, it's not as interesting thinking of it that way, but it's ultimately what it is. The crow just comes down to exactly what Michael Berryman laid out that, yeah. that you know, um, uh, someone came in who didn't have the experience and wasn't careful with checking 
a barrel and this tragedy happens. And a lot of what comes from that in terms of these legends is us trying to, April Wolf says it right in the um, Poltergeist episode is that someone can just be gone. Like they're here and then they're gone. And that's very hard to wrap your head around. And this offers some sort of bigger explanation for uh, the fragility of life because it's hard Mm -hmm. to accept that in an instant someone can be gone. I mean, two months before this series came out, I lost my dad to lung cancer after like a quick two month battle. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, it was not a battle, but, uh, and that just, you know, offered a whole new perspective on that concept. And it, it makes sense that people would say, you know, how can, how can these two people, these young, talented people with their lives ahead of them, just have been, you know, taken from us that early. And there has to be some explanation uh, for that because that means that I can be taken out in, in, uh, you know, that quickly. And, and uh, it, it just, I feel like it, and horror does that as well. Like, I think horror, I mean, it, it feels like it might prime you for a little bit of that, of, of, of like, you know, uh, dealing with loss or dealing with death or, but, you know, as I say that, I, I, again, think about losing my dad and, and maybe it's bullshit because it, it, it's not like, you know, the, the Halloween series primed me for my dad dying, you know, like mm-hmm. it really yeah. Not, yeah, for sure. did not do the work for me. So it, it, but there is something there to that, you know, it is, it, horror is dealing with a lot of big questions that religion deals with as well. And, and, you know, Mitch, I know you've talked about that, uh, uh as well, like just this relationship between horror and religion and yeah, um, yeah. it's a very strong c- connection, I think. It's extraordinary, you know, and again, th- that probably is what makes horror unique among genres. You know, it dawns on me as we're talking about the relationship between horror and social policy, mass health beliefs, you know, today in North America, Cremation is the funerary choice of about half of all people. Hmm. So it's very common. But back in the 1870s, when cremation was first getting introduced in the United States, it was first introduced in New York City, actually, uh, it was considered exotic and weird and something that harkened backwards to primeval antiquity. It was considered pagan. And one of the advocates of cremation, a retired Civil War colonel named uh, Henry Steele Olcott, he wrote an article, fairly influential article, talking about all the benefits of cremation. Uh, it was more hygienic, so on and so forth. Didn't you know? Didn't didn't command land usage, things like that. And he also said uh, in this article, it should be noted that in lands where cremation is routinely practiced, such as India, there are reduced reports of vampirism. And he actually said huh. this, you know, with huh. total ingenuousness, huh. you know, total huh. ingenuousness. And it struck me that back in the 1870s, you know, this was before uh, Dracula was published, obviously long before, you know, the movie industry was even envisioned. Mm -hmm. I suspect that most Americans didn't even know what vampires were. You know, they wouldn't have had any idea like, well, good, that's some disease they they don't have in India. So let's 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 do that here. And uh, it's just funny today, you know, how that could have been used as an argument back then, among other arguments, including hygiene. And it passed muster because most people didn't know what vampires were. Today, of course, you literally couldn't meet a person in North America who doesn't know what a vampire is. Which is yeah. which makes me think as, as well, part of what this series, uh, we tried to do in this series was look at some of the, you know, the, like that, that is, is a, a funny, inter, you know, claim that, you know, we laugh at now, but then you look at this poltergeist episode and, and there are people that think that because the 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 use of a biological skeleton on the set um that Craig Reardon used ended up using this thing as a a means of you know at the time not being able to sculpt uh unique skeletons for all of these purposes um that that's something that could actually even even if they don't think it it literally cursed the set that it 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 is some some form of disrespect that you know might might um bring something upon the set that that would ultimately cause some sort of uh accidents or or tragedies and and that idea seems ridiculous but you know in in discussing magical thinking and 
you know, all of the various things that everyone does on a day-to-day basis um, that might seem, you know, like uh, any sort of uh, superstitious uh, use of a lucky coin or, you know, whatever it might be. Some We talk about the idea in the Poltergeist episode of the Red Sox jersey being buried in Yankee Stadium and that they actually jackhammered it out because they were worried that it would have an effect on the player's game. Yeah, I remember the this. Interesting, the interesting thing is that you, you almost wonder if it would, it could have, if if the players believe enough that, mm-hmm. you know, are superstitious enough. And we all know sports players. I, I know nothing about sports. So when I say we all, yeah. you all except me know that, <laughs> that <laughs> baseball is super, super, super superstitious. Sport. Yeah, yeah. Like I mean, more than any of them. And, and so a, a pitcher, you know, on the mound, throwing a f- fastball uh they they might if they knew that that jersey was in the stadium would that give them some sort of anxiety that you know they would allow that belief to overtake them and and even on the most minute level affect their game i mean that ultimately is kind of a curse in a way i i guess mm-hmm. um, yeah but so it was you know trying to not just point out that you know some of these things seem ridiculous but that we, I think we engage in a lot of this kind of thinking regularly, uh, even people who, who are s- skeptical and, and horror movies reveal that because we're, mm-hmm. they induce anxiety. Like you can be the, the, I mean, we talked, uh, um, you know, we talk about the, the idea of the, the matrix of like cursed horror films, non-cursed horror films, uh, cursed non-horror film, you know, like laying out mm-hmm. all the, like yeah. Michael does and he's the ultimate you know self-proclaimed skeptic and he's he's even affected by you know horror movies he talks about the shining as being a film that Mm. that affects him and yeah you know horror can kind of break down i think that that uh closed-minded wall and and get at you in a very real way and being able to kind of explore that in this series and look at all of the other ways that we might engage in this kind of thinking you know, don't don't be too quick to laugh at EA Coetting's um, ritual when a, a huge chunks of the population engage in in their own forms of ritual every day. Um, so I, I I don't know. I would like to think that even though there's, I think there is a perspective within the series. It's also there is also an attempt to be open minded as well. Yeah, I think so. Um, getting to getting to your superstitious thinking may cause a curse on its own kind of thinking. Have you ever seen Bull Durham? A long time ago. I'm more of a Field of Dreams man, but <laughs> Field of Dreams is great too. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, but uh, Bull Durham has the has the moment where Tim Robbins is pitching very well, and and he uh, uh, lends all of this great pitching to the fact that he's not sleeping with Susan Sarandon. And, uh, and Kevin Costner, he's talking to Kevin Costner on the bus. He's like, you know what? I'm thinking of giving in. He goes, no, you can't give in. He's like, he's like, why not? It's like, because you know, you always respect the streak. You always respect the streak. It is big. If you think it's, you're playing well because you're getting late or not getting late, it's because you are, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and so, uh, it goes a long way to, to, to backing that, uh, possible thinking up and everything. I, I think um, Uncut Gems dealt with that in a really great way as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, that's an interesting comment. You know, I, 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 it's funny how, you know, you'll, you'll, within the recesses of our own innermost thoughts, private experiences, we'll experience things from time to time that will that will shatter. You know, what, what we self perceive as rationality. I always think of an instance where I was giving a, a talk one evening to a group of physicians. And uh, as often happens, one of them came up to me during a coffee break and said, listen, you know, you seem like a good guy. I'm not interested in any of this stuff you're talking about. I am not a believer in any of this stuff. But I did have this clairvoyant dream once. And he starts telling me about this dream (laughs) that's, you know, more blood curdling than anything, you know, I've ever entertained or come up with. And it's just very interesting, you know, but then when he went, when he rejoined the group, as often happens, you know, he, he was playing the role of strict denialist again but you'll find when people step outside of their social roles even if they really are strictly non-believers in any kind of extra physical phenomena 
they'll say, you know, there was this one time where something weird happened. And quite frankly, speaking personally, it's that one time that gets me interested. It's the, it's not the 99% of claims from believers. It's the 1% of questions from non-believers that, that fascinate me. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I've I've always wondered that myself. Just to you know, just, just like you know, because I don't I don't really ever experience that type of stuff either. But I've had maybe one instance in my life where I've thought, was that a dream or was that you know what was that you know? And and I think about it often, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the, there's another uh, really I guess somber interview in this, and I believe it's Richard Sawyer. Mm-hmm. Um, who is, uh, I think he was the art director on twilight zone. Who's on the John Landis portion, um, of it. And, uh, th- that interview, I can't believe you got him first off because to have been in that situation, uh, to watch it live, so to speak, I don't, I can't believe he even, he can't, you got, you got that guy. Did it take a lot of, uh, convincing to get him it didn't i mean it feels like he was either ready to talk about it or or wanted has wanted to talk about it um i remember calling him not necessarily for a pre-interview but just to connect with him and he was uh driving with his his wife and even on the phone over speakerphone while driving he was uh you know choking up talking about it and clearly it was a horrendous experience and uh it seems like he has some form of um you know ptsd left over from that experience which uh you know the fact that it took place on a vietnam set is even a a weirder connection Mm -hmm. there but um yeah he he was uh he was just, I, I just feel like he was ready to talk about it. And again, the, I, the, the great thing about documentary filmmaking is this idea of this mutual trust where, you know, there, you, you trust in the subject that they're going to be honest and, and, you know, attempt to, um, I, I guess not only provide you with what you're hoping to get for the sake of the, the, the piece, but, um, will do so in a way that's, that's open and honest and real. And, and then they trust in you to take that open and honest and real, um, uh, discussion or reaction and present it in a way in the piece that is in itself honest. And whenever you, you can strike up that agreement, um, and just have a, an interview like that, it's it's just such a special thing because it's a very personal and very intimate um, experience and very emotional. And the fact that he was willing to share that with us, I'm obviously very grateful for. Um, and it's it is a a very intense episode. Well, this was the second time I had seen it because I watched it. Um, I, I have Shutter, so I watched it when it premiered on Shutter, and then I watched it again. You know, just before we talked to you guys and. I had, you know, I had, I remembered the, you guys showed all the footage um, and that's kind of what stuck in my head. But watching it the second time, I was thinking about when he was sitting there, like you were cutting back and forth, but he was saying things like, um, you know, I was watching it thinking it wasn't great, but then I was like, but it's okay. We went through this. And I was just like, oh my God, like he's there, like, you know, Mm -hmm. in that moment, like he's clearly like back at that night. Um you know, detail and everything, which was something, I guess, just because I hadn't never seen the footage before that was kind of sticking with me more the first time. And then the second time I watched it, I caught all that stuff, which was, which was fascinating. I, I, I mean, that was, that was, and he was a genius. I mean, production designer, mm-hmm. obviously. I mean, that, that set was insane. Yeah, um, yeah. Made it sound like he built it like in a day too, like the way he talked. <laughs> I don't know if that's the case, but. Yeah. And he um, was very proud of that work yeah. as well. And he was supposed to work on the rest of the, the film. Uh, he, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, uh, and you're right when he's talking about it, he's clearly back in that mm-hmm. moment. And there's the, on our end, the, the kind of choice of how much we show and what we show. And uh, I mean, that accident was filmed with 
I think five cameras, um, you know, why the, the, what we ended up using was the widest shot. There's a, you know, a medium, almost a medium close up of this happening and Ugh. which ultimately makes you realize that just how little sense the whole thing made, you know, the, the, the widest shot, you can't see them enough to understand that it wouldn't be a stunt double and uh, two dolls that they could have right. used. And in the closest shot, you can't see the helicopter. So what, like they could have done it without the helicopter. So it makes absolutely no sense. Uh, and even the leading up to that, where you're just seeing Mario running, uh, you know, through the explosions. I mean, it, that's just, that's terrifying. Like, yeah, it's crazy. It's insane what they, what, yeah. what they asked him to do with those kids. And yeah, it, it's just a horrendous accident. And, and, you know, that's ultimately, uh, I guess kind of what we were getting at, you know, some people have questioned, well, if, why would you show that and not show Brandon Lee's accident? And for one, Brandon Lee's accident, it was filmed, but the film was destroyed. But even if it wasn't destroyed, mm -hmm. we wouldn't show it because the, the idea is that by the end of the series, you know, we've, we've had our fun talking about all of these tragedies that occurred off camera and are now just shared as legends around, uh, you know, whatever prover proverbial campfire horror, horror fan campfires we've had on, on the internet or in person. And it's very easy to talk about a lot of that stuff because we don't see, you know, the, the results of those accidents, um, or deaths or whatever it might be. But, this one was captured with five cameras and it, it, it just, I think reveals that, or I hope it, it suggests that, you know, um, not necessarily, uh, that you should feel bad for having shared these stories, but just to remember that there, these affected real people in very real ways mm -hmm. and not just the people that this accident, you know, directly affected, but those who were, on set and you know richard sawyer is is uh, that's a lifelong and for john landis as well as we say at the end of the episode like the the curse of the twilight zone is kind of cheesy as it sounds but i think it's true in that the curse is that they all have to live with that yeah, yeah. and michael michael massey i think that's how you pronounce his last name um or massey the 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 guy involved in the in the brandon lee shooting i think he had passed he's passed away correct is that right yeah, yeah. Um, but I can't like, like that's, I mean, you know, and he did, I mean, he did nothing, you know, he, he was doing what he was supposed to do on set and, you know, then he ended up, you know, killing somebody. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. the, the way this affects all these people is like, I just, I, yeah, like you're saying, um, you know, people are passing around these legends and weren't there. And it's just, it's, it's interesting to think about how much it affects actual people. And, uh, this documentary does a great job of showing that. So. Yeah, I, appreciated I, it. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm glad that the Brandon Lee footage isn't available too. Um, mm -hmm. I think just the fact that, uh, just the reenactment, well, it wasn't really a reenactment. It was the, the test that the, you see, show the guy with the gun and how, what would have happened in that scenario was enough for me. Just seeing a, a hole get blown through a piece of wood uh, is enough for me to sort of imagine, mm. uh, exactly what that was like and everything, uh, with something we just don't need to see in our lives. Uh, yeah. And I mean, so the, the, the other thing with the twilight zone is I think some people don't understand because there's this, this, you know, mystique around the footage, this idea of like, oh, it's out there, but we've never seen it and we've heard about it and I've never had the guts to watch it. You know, like it just kind of this weird, um, the, the, this reputation that footage was aired on the the nightly news at the time oh my god yeah i read i read about that afterwards i was really curious about that yeah that's crazy yeah i mean there's a there's a moment in the show where we show a newscast and cut away mm -hmm. from it right before the helicopter lands and that's me cutting away like they showed the helicopter hitting on the news so this this is not something like we're you know uh some grotesque exclusive um that we're bringing to people um you know this is something that at the time was was uh replayed on on the nightly news during mm -hmm. the, the course of this trial and and was 
very public. And, you know, I think that's another interesting aspect of the legacy of both that film and the idea of the, the, a, a curse. And one thing we didn't get into is how it ultimately affected the reception of the movie. There's, there was a news report where they interviewed people coming out of the theater and the majority of them were just like, I couldn't get that out of my mind. You know, like the mm-hmm, fact that mm-hmm. that segment is still in the film and it's obviously truncated and they had to, you know, make do with what they had. Um, it's very hard to watch that film and and walk away and not be reminded of that tragedy. And even more so by the fact that they don't even acknowledge it. You know, there's no, in Poltergeist 3, as Gary, Gary Sherman mentions, even though it's, you know, the gesture is, is in no way um, makes up for the fact that he, as he said, had to shoot with a double and all, all of the stuff he had to go through. But they put a card in there saying in the memory of Heather O'Rourke it, with Twilight Zone, the movie, there's nothing. There's no acknowledgement mm-hmm. um, in the film as, in regards to what happened. So. That yeah. that uh, that uh, discussion about Poltergeist three about how they just didn't want to finish it. Uh, I was, I, I mean, I he was like, yeah, and then we just did that stupid ending and everything, and like, yeah, like seriously, was there was was the studio's bottom line going to be completely just blown out of the water if they just didn't make Poltergeist three? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's astounding the, the way commerce sort of gets in the way of, of, uh, just, you know, leaving things be sometimes. Um, yeah. And it, it's a recurring thing throughout the series, the, this idea of having to finish a film, after having lost a crew member and, and with the crow, even though it was strange as Lance Anderson mentions to be creating a, a face mask off of a life cast of Brandon Lee uh, in order to finish the film, at, at least in that case, they were doing it. Um, I mean, you know, obviously the, the studio wants the film finished and there's money to be, ma- be made, but for the people who came back to work on it, they were doing it with this feeling that, you know, they brand this film meant a lot to Brandon and we wanted to make sure that it was seen. Otherwise it would have been all for nothing. So there's, there's something nice about that, but it's still just a, a really horrible thing to have to go through, you know, to be on set, having lost your, your, uh, star and seeing a stunt double walking around on set with the, that star's, latex face plastered on mm-hmm. um it's it's weird just thinking about it's weird thinking about john landis who the you know the episode of twilight zone says you tried to get uh, in touch with him and he he did not answer back mm-hmm. but uh it's weird uh, when you think about a director like john landis who does movies like blues brothers and animal house and everything to be this kind of an ego maniac kind of you know, driven person and everything. It just, just, it just, that's one of the weird things about watching something like that. You never would think somebody like that would have that kind of, um, that, I don't know, that kind of, uh, ego to them, uh, and everything. It's just a a fascinating thing. Yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, I would have loved to have talked to him, but it obviously makes sense why he wouldn't. And right. I think he would very much be, from what I understand, he does not allow that to come up in any interviews. Um, But also, you know, the episode I think does, does present this as a very obviously irresponsible thing that occurred, but I would imagine he's, he's also lived with a lot of um, heavy guilt and, and um, the experience of having gone through that. I, I, unless he's a complete, sociopath I, I would imagine he's uh he's had to deal with that in a real way but but yeah it's uh it is amazing though that you know that they could come out the other end of of that whole thing and and n- there's no consequences other than a, a fine a financial one um because they couldn't really place the blame on any one person i guess um but uh i don't know it, it it's a very in some ways a very complicated situation, but in other ways it isn't. I mean, we had Kane Hodder in there speaking about it as well, who has obviously a lot of experience with stunt work and talking about that, you know, in, in those situations, there's, 
there's sometimes no one person to blame. And it does seem like, especially in something like the Brandon Lee scenario, you, you can blame one person who had one job. Um, but it's also a, a series of s- things that had to align in a very particular way for that to happen. And as demonstrated in that gun um, demonstration, the, the, all of the things that had to go wrong for that to happen, you know, it's, it's just so tragic when you analyze it uh, after the fact. And, and he was able to replicate that more than once. So um, even though it, it is a series of, of missteps and things that were overlooked that ultimately led, it was like the perfect formula to lead to this accident. It's something that feels like it would have happened every time if, if that mistake was made. Yeah. Um, I know that you guys have to, uh, uh head out soon, but, um, there was a couple more things. Uh, it was, you know, you, you bringing up Kane Hodder, uh, also reminds me that you, uh, feature trauma in here, uh, quite a bit, uh, and, and how the, the, you know, the, they have that philosophy, Hey, it's just a movie. You know, we, if we, if we had to, if we did something that was super dangerous and then it, you know, it, uh, it hurt anybody. I don't think we could make movies anymore. Um, mm. You know, what, what was, uh, what was your experience in getting Lloyd Kaufman out on this? Well, I mean, the, the experience was great. I, I, we were on set for Shakespeare Shitstorm, <laughs> <laughs> And he, when we were interviewing Lloyd and this probably does not surprise anyone who's familiar with trauma uh, Lloyd was doing his interview while they were still filming scenes in <laughs> another room. <laughs> so yeah. His wife. H- hence the, yeah. hence the, uh, dr- the costume, right? <laughs> yeah. Which, which, uh, you know, I think some people question cause we never really explain why he's in drag, but I, I would say he looks like a Brian Eno yeah. impersonator. If you know who Lloyd Kaufman is though. I don't know why you would question it. Like, yeah, that's Lloyd. He's yeah. 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 But his, his wife who's producing that film. Yeah. Just kept coming in and, and, you know, saying Lloyd. You, you have to come in. I mean, we, we need you to, and he's like, yeah, yeah, just a, just a minute. And he was just overly accommodating and, um, he was great, but I, I think he also, I think, you know, having the, the sort of lighthearted trauma, you know, in moment in that episode, it tonally is a little at odds, but it also feels like a little bit of levity in the middle of a very dark episode, but ultimately, by the end of the episode, when he starts speaking about how serious he is in regards to safety, seeing someone like Lloyd taking that much care and, and speaking that seriously about it, I, I think just um, reveals that it was just a major oversight. Um, and, and it's true that, uh, you know, a, a studio like Troma, if something happened on one of their sets, it would pretty much end them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, in a Steven Spielberg executive produced major uh, motion picture, still was released with the segment that the accident took place on, like leading the film. <laughs> and the yeah, song- that was also 1983 versus you know 2020. I don't, I don't think yeah. that would happen yeah. today. I at least I would like to think it wouldn't happen. No, no. Today. And part of the reason it wouldn't is because of what happened on Twilight Zone, the movie. Yeah, and it does raise some very weird questions about, I mean, one of the films that we were going to talk about in this uh, season, but ultimately didn't was stalker, which is a uh, kind of a, a, a different film um, amongst this group. It, it's a uh, Andre Tarkovsky uh, yeah. sort of uh, mystical science, kind of science fiction film. And the idea of, you know, that film went through a lot of uh, troubles and, and um, some people think that the the deaths of a number of crew members um, of, of cancer was related to the fact that they filmed in the polluted river for a long period of time and so on and so forth. But we did interview someone who worked on the film and, and whether this is a very Eastern kind of um, Eastern European perspective, the, it, it was never looked at as like, you know... Um, we we regret this experience and you know all of this stuff happened and it was a nightmare it was more uh uh, yes all of this happened but we got to work with the master tarkovsky and we created this great piece of art and it's just a different perspective and and it does you think like yeah i mean 
is it, it it's certainly not any it would certainly and let me be 100 percent clear here that it would certainly not be any better if an accident happened on a film that was good or bad but there there is this perspective of especially when they ultimately end up releasing the film after the fact like and then you start weighing the reviews against twilight zone the movie uh, you know based on in this grotesque way like a news reporter standing outside saying, well, what did you think of the film? Was it, was it worth the, the oh, yeah. lives? Mm-hmm. Like not saying that directly, but it ultimately that's kind of what they're, they're getting at in a, in a very weird way. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's just, yeah, it's, it's a fucked up thing. I mean, it's that, that episode is a, uh, yeah, it's a very, it's a dark one. And I, I, I kind of mentioned this before, but it, it was an unexpected sort of arc throughout this series that, as this, the series goes on, the idea of a curse is kind of slowly set aside and, and it's replaced by just this idea of these projects being ill-fated, you know, like the, the the irresponsibility of some of the people involved ultimately are to blame for, for what happened. Um, so, so that arc is definitely something that we might not have been thinking about at the top because we didn't know how deep it would go, but certainly as I was cutting it and as we were, um, you know, uh, trying to figure out what order the films would go in, that was sort of the, uh, the, the line of thinking. And even though, you know, Shudder ended up releasing them out of order, um, the Poltergeist episode was supposed to be first. There, there was that consideration. It was, I I think affected a little bit by the, the, the ordering of the episodes, but, on the Blu-ray, which will be coming out, um, they are in the order as intended. Uh, there's no director's cuts. There, there is the director's order. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, was, I was always curious about that because I do remember Shutter aired The Exorcist first. The, they aired The Exorcist and The Omen were that first week, and I I could have sworn I remembered Ryan Turek at the very beginning of The Exorcist saying the bit about you know, cursed films, but I guess, was that always in the poltergeist episode? And I just remembered that incorrectly. Yeah, it was always in the poltergeist. Okay. The, the, I mean, it's very subtle that, you know, this, that the, the way it was ordered, yeah. I think it just asked a lot of people for people to dig, dig right into the exorcist episode and see these real exorcisms and, you know, yeah. uh, without getting a sense of what the tone of the series is and what, what we're trying to do. So the poltergeist episode, I think eased you into it a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, but whatever they, they, they had the rights to the exorcist on the streaming service and wanted to align it with that. Oh, right. that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I remember when they did that on their shutter TV service, they did, they, they I think they aired that and then the exorcist or something, yeah. if I remember correctly, but in Turek was on all the, uh, he was on all the promotions too, with that line. So maybe that's what, yeah. maybe that's what I'm thinking, but it did make more sense to me watching on this version, it made more sense to me, Poltergeist being the first one, because you guys really get into kind of just the whole series in that one. Yeah, we kind of um, established the, yeah. the whole concept off the top. So, and I don't want to sound like I'm not grateful for, you know, whatever. <laughs> it was aired the way it was aired, but, <laughs> Absolutely. but the, the Blu-ray is the definitive director's order. Yeah. And that's <laughs> uh, that's supposed to come out August 18th, right? Yes. And as uh, as I already mentioned, I'm a massive Blu-ray head. And to have a Blu-ray out is uh, an exciting. It's amazing. Thing. <laughs> well, and it's it's horror. I mean, it's horror too. And like that's. I mean, I I, I feel like the majority of your collectors are horror fans, right? And mm-hmm. those seem to be, you know, like House Four comes out on Blu-ray, and everybody's like stoked on life. Um, <laughs> you probably wouldn't get that if it was just some random romantic comedy or something, you know? So, yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the ways yeah. in which my collecting has shifted. I guess I had yeah. to go of the breakup with Vince Vaughn and Jennifer Aniston and <laughs> for a digital copy of that and uh, make room for all of the vinegar syndrome releases. That- <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, uh, before we sign off, uh, and, and I think we are coming out with this on the day of the Blu-ray re- release, right, Jonathan? Is that what? Uh, that, what yeah, saying? that's that's our plan, yeah. And, and you are, if that's the case, you are able to say that you have a sequel coming out to this, a second series? Yes, where uh, Shutter has ordered five more episodes of Cursed Films, and they are the episodes are going to be longer. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm I can't say which films we're covering yet, 
but I can say that I'm very excited by the films we're covering. I think it's a very diverse collection of films and a fun part of it is it will be taking us out of uh, North America. We'll be doing some traveling nice. this episode. It's going to have a more international feel. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm just excited to get to speak with uh, another round of, of filmmakers who were responsible for some films I really love. And is but, that a hack o lanterns one of them, right? I mean, that's, <laughs> I will not confirm or deny. <laughs> and you are, you're aiming for a 2021 release on those. Yeah, we are. Of course, there's lots of considerations right now. Sure. With, uh, you know, the global health crisis, but, um, mm-hmm. but yeah, we're, we're, we're going to do our best with that. Guys, thank you for coming in and uh, talking about Curse Films. This is uh, this has been fantastic. Um, uh, uh, I'd like to thank Jay Cheel and Mitch Horowitz for uh, giving us their time on this. Um, uh, it's a very fascinating subject, uh, and uh, and uh, don't don't uh, don't give in to the haters there, Jay. You know the, <laughs> about you know the you know you you made you made the you know any film buff is going to watch this and and enjoy it. I believe so. Um, right, it comes it comes out on Blu-ray on August eighteenth, and uh, you should uh, check that check that out. Thank All you. right, well that's going to do it for this interview. It's Chris Atkins and Jonathan Watkins. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Comment on our episodes on our SoundCloud page. Check us out on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Reddit. And be sure to visit CinemaSins.com.